Wisconsin Eye's 2014 election coverage is brought to you by the Wisconsin Hospital Association. For over 90 years, a valued voice for Wisconsin hospitals, supporting high quality, high value care in communities like yours. Wisconsin Eye coverage of the 2014 elections continues with an interview with Mr. Ryan Pfeiffer of NENA. He's a Republican candidate in Assembly District 55. Ryan, welcome to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you for having me. And just this programming note, Wisconsin Eye appreciates the support of the Wisconsin Hospital Association, which represents more than 139 hospitals and health systems for making these candidate interviews possible. Um, first run for public office, Mr. Pfeiffer. It is, it is. I've been a quality job creator for quite a while now and this is my first run at, at any sort of public office, but it's it's been a fun and exciting experience I want so to pursue far. That. Let's come back to you say on your website you're a job creator. So tell yeah. us about you and what you do and specifically job creation, how? Sure. Well, when I was actually 12 years old going to school at Trinity Lutheran in Nina, um, I started my first job for our family business. I was the bathroom cleaner. Um, my grandfather in the 1950s and his brother started Pfeiffer Brothers Construction Company and they were building residential houses at the time and around 1960 they switched over and, and started building bridges for the Wisconsin Department of Transportation and, and since then we've, we've continued and, and been fortunate enough to have about 40 employees on average most of the years. And, and it, it's been a, a great experience to see people being able to work hard out in the sun and, and support their families. Uh, so you, you building bridges then for state and local governments? Yeah, I would say 99% of our work is going to be exclusively for the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. It is. Every once in a while we'll get a little municipality. Um, we've got one for the village of Howard right now that's, that's going on. Um, okay. But, uh, but most of our work is DOT, well, low bid contract. You are well suited then for one of my primary yes. questions. You know there's projected $650 million deficit yes. two years from now. Mm -hmm. in the Department of Transportation budget. Uh, how would you fill it? Well, I don't think there's any one fix right now that that can fix it. Um, the gas tax, I know, is one that people have talked about for years and, and raising that, and it hasn't been adjusted for inflation since 2006. But with fuel-efficient cars and electric cars hitting the market at the rate that they are, the gas tax is a dying revenue source, and no matter what you do to the gas tax, it's not going to fill our shortfall. Um, we do have to invest in infrastructure because if we're going to expect businesses to relocate here in Wisconsin and expand here in Wisconsin. We've got to make sure that our infrastructure creates a competitive advantage for them. If it costs more to get their product to market here in Wisconsin than say it does in Iowa, they're going to go to Iowa. So we, we've got to shore up our roads and our bridges, but we've got to do it feasibly. Um, I don't have all the answers, but, but I think we're, we're looking at, at different revenue sources. Um, there was a recent study out that showed that a, a Wisconsin driver that gets about 22 miles to gallon on their vehicle that drives about 12,000 miles a year sp spends in taxes and fees about $275. Well, if you look at our neighbors in Minnesota and Iowa, that's between 420 and 475 for the same mileage vehicle, the same driver. Um, so our residents right now are paying less for their infrastructure, and I think we're seeing that a little bit in our deficit. I, I don't know which route the public is going to want to do to make sure that we're investing appropriately in infrastructure, um, but I'm willing to sit down and, and talk with our residents to see which one is going to be the best Are for them. Are you yet ready to raise the gas tax, which as you correctly said hasn't been increased since mm -hmm. 2006? What about 75 bucks you and I pay to register our vehicles? And what about this recommendation made two years ago that every time we register our vehicles, we should tell DOT how many miles we've traveled to be a small surtax? Yep. Are you ready to vote for either of those three? I think we've got to look at all three of them. I'm not sure which one the, the people of our state think most benefits them. When the gas tax was first placed into service, it was because we thought that the user fee system was the best way to, to fund infrastructure. That the people using our federal highways or our state highways are the ones paying for it. Mm -hmm. And I like that system. Um, I don't think the people that don't use our highways should be paying for it. So all of those ideas mimic our user fee system of the gas tax in originality um, and I'd be open to, to all of them or a combination of the of the above as long as we make sure we get the proper input from our local residents. And just a quick a final question on this issue. If you're elected to the assembly, would you step completely out of the process of submitting bids for DOT because you'd be voting as a member of the assembly on DOT's budget? Correct, and I actually submitted a request to the Government Accountability Board just to make sure that I could continue in my, my family business there. Um, 
from what I have heard back from other people in the industry, the GAB has not gotten back to me yet on their final word. Right. Um, but because there wouldn't be a bill that directly affected my business, and if there was, like you're right, I could not vote on that. But because the, the state budget would affect everybody in my industry equally, it shouldn't be a conflict of interest there for me to be able to vote on it. But if there's anything that would come up that was even remotely giving the idea that that would be a conflict in my interest, I would step away and, and not vote on that particular bill. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, I want to move on to the issue of schools. And you have put on your website a rather long PowerPoint on Common Core. The bottom line is, it looks to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, are you saying Wisconsin should withdraw from its... Uh, the 2010 decision to adopt Common Core yeah, I'm, That's correct. I'm not a fan of Common Core. Um, the ideas of increased testing and, and making sure that our children are able to compete globally, uh, those are honorable traits, and I don't think anybody can argue with those. Um, but when we look at the states that have adopted Common Core, um, even Republican governors that had come out, Oklahoma being one, you know, just in the beginning of this year, they had made the same statements that Wisconsin's making. Our teachers are going to be able to set their curriculum. They're going to be able to choose their own textbooks. Well, now that they've started to implement the testing of it, they've realized that that's just simply not the case. The local control is lost, and they'd like to make their own system, which increases accountability, but re retains the local control. Um, I'm not one of the guys that tells you the sky is falling and we're trying to data track everybody. I, I, I don't go that far, but I fear the loss of, of local control. And I think we can do a better job by trusting our UW system. Um, UW-Madison, right here in town, for instance, is ranked 19th in the world. And we didn't ask for their input at all to find out where our high school graduates should be upon graduation. Let's, let's utilize our UW system, our technical schools, and as well as our employers to find out where exactly our high school graduates should be upon graduation so that they're either ready to enter the workforce or college. And um, uh, on another K-12 issue, um, the next budget will have to decide whether we continue to expand choice statewide, whether we keep the 1,000 limit mm -hmm. outside the two uh, cities in southeast was, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, what's your position on choice and charter and expansion? I think that, that school choice is a good way for parents to determine what's best for their children. Uh, I don't think that any of us that have children even remotely believe that two children learn the same way. I've got a six-year-old and a five-year-old. There are some times that the, the five-year-old is simply surpassing the six-year-old in, in certain subjects and vice versa the other way. Um, so no two school systems, or no one school system, I'm sorry, is going to be able to address all of our students' needs. Okay. Um, and we should allow parents the opportunities to, to send children where they think it is best suited. Um, I don't think funding alone is going to solve our, our problem. Um, I looked just recently, uh, MPS spends about $14,000 per student. That's the fourth highest in the nation. Yet we consistently hear that their schools are, are not excelling to the rate that we'd like. Uh, Wisconsin is similar in that they're the top, we're in the top third for spending per student. Mm -hmm. um, and our increases in 2010 and 11 were against the national average. The nation at that point was reducing spending and we were increasing it. Now we've been behind the curve a little bit and since caught up with Act 10 just a little bit. Um, but I think when you look at what private schools can do, I went to Fox Valley Lutheran in Appleton, our competitor was Xavier High School. I, I checked theirs. If you walk in off the street, that high quality education is going to cost you between eight and $9,000 a year, where Wisconsin's spending nearly $12,000 a year per student. So with a competitive marketplace, I think we can have a high quality education without spending the, the high dollars that, that we have in the it public education It sounds like you're system. saying we should remove the 1,000 uh, student cap on choice outside the city of Milwaukee and Racine in the next budget? Um, is that, as a, long fair, as we is that a fair read? As long as we can budget it appropriately. I, I think we have to determine how we are going to fund our educational system. Are we just going to fund public education or are we going to create a funding system for all of our children? Um, and I think that's the route to go, but we're going to have to start from the bottom up. Just eliminating a cap and, and moving money out of the public education system I don't think is the answer. Um, I think the states are a great testing ground, and I, for one, would be willing to sit down and, and let's make Wisconsin the progressive group, if you will, not in a negative sense, but in the sense that, that we can create a system that works for all of our students and is cost effective. How do you feel about the decision in the current budget by uh, Governor Walker and the leaders of the Assembly and Senate to tell the federal government, 
we don't want your money even though you're willing to expand uh, MA healthcare mm -hmm. to more to more residents. W was that a wise choice? I, I think it was, and for two issues. One is the, the one that you see in the news all the time, that the federal government is willing to pay now in the short term, but we don't know what's going to happen in the long term. And, and that fear alone, I think, justified not expanding the program. But one of the other things that, that doesn't get a lot of publicity, but I think is equally scary, is that the federal government mandates that the states that have Medicaid have a program in place to recoup the funds that participants get after death from their estate. Um, so if we expand the program to 55 to 64 year olds that maybe they, they lost their job or took early retirement, they're gonna have a, an asset base that's probably higher than the more elderly that we're anticipating going into Medicaid. Um, and I would hate to see those people losing the family farm so that their children can't inherit or the family home that they built or the meager savings account that you know, grandma worked their entire life to save, not being able to, to gift that or, or inherit that to their children because they were forced unexpectedly into Medicaid it, it is concerning to me. And Wisconsin's in a unique situation. If you're below the poverty level, the federal poverty level, you can get into Medicaid and then your asset base probably isn't as big of a concern. But if you're above that line but still income insufficient, if you will, to, to be self-sufficient on, on insurance, you'll be in the, in the health exchange system, which may qualify you for federal subsidies up to 100% of the premiums. So you're not spending a lot of money on your health care out of pocket, but you're also not risking your asset base if you were in the Medicaid program. I, I think Wisconsin's path is much better because we were able to blaze our own trail. Um, I'm asking all candidates this because it's so timely. Your reaction to Judge Crabb's ruling that uh, the constitutional prohibition on same-sex marriage is uh, uh, unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. I'm a religious person. I'm a Lutheran. Um, I'm pro-life, but this is a divisive issue, which I think takes our focus off of creating an environment where employers want to relocate here, um, get high-quality jobs for our, our children in the future, and grow our economy. Um, our civic organizations, our churches, our families are going to have to step up and instill in our young people the traditional values that each local municipality thinks is appropriate. Um, sadly, activist judges are always going to be able to, to place their will ahead of that of the voters. Um, and I don't think that there's a fix right now in place for the legislature to do anything about it. Whatever we do as a legislature is going to get shot down in the courts. Um, and, and I look forward to the Supreme Court putting a final say on it um, one way or the other. But when it comes right down to it, we, we need to take and make sure that our grassroots efforts are there to instill the values that, that our local municipalities are looking so for. So when Democrats next session try to offer, uh, try to have that constitutional prohibition removed from the Constitution, are you going to fight it? Um, I haven't seen a bill on it. Okay. Uh, it it'd be interesting if they want to go through the democratic process of you know, amending the Constitution again. My personal vote would be for traditional marriage, okay. um, but if we're going to do it via the democratic process, I wouldn't be opposed to them using the same process that amended the Constitution originally. Thank you. Two Democratic candidates for Attorney General say first offense drunken driving should be a crime. Mm -hmm. Your position? Um, I, I think our current statute is actually pretty good. Um, we've got teeth in the statute, which should serve as a deterrent. Um, it's not a crime. We're the only one in the in the nation that has that system in place. But if you have somebody under the age of 16 in the car with you, then it is a crime. Um, you're going to lose your license for six to nine months, regardless. You're going to have a penalty of about 300 bucks. Your insurance is going to skyrocket. Um, and if your blood alcohol level is above 0.15, you're going to have an ignition interlock in your vehicle for at least a year um, after you get your license back. Those are some pretty big teeth in the the law as it is, and yet we're not deterring at the rate that we'd like. So I think we have to take a look at the Winnebago County system um, for people that have had criminal convictions for drunk driving and use intensive drug rehab and addiction rehab. Um, I don't think putting more people in prison is the answer to this problem. Um, I think it's getting people the help they need to address their addictions. Um, in 2012, or by the end of 2012, we had over 400,000 people with at least one offense for drunk driving. Giving each of them a criminal conviction or time in prison probably isn't going to solve the problem, but getting them help they need from professionals is the first step I think we should be looking at. As somebody who's part of a family business, I want to ask you, do you have a position on the calls to raise the minimum wage in Wisconsin? I do. Um, when I started 
at age 12, I received the minimum wage, and I was, I was cleaning bathrooms. I knew that cleaning bathrooms wasn't something that I wanted to do for my entire career, and it was no way to raise a family, but it was an entry level to learn what you were doing and, and then move your way either up through the ranks or to a new career. Um, and I think that's what minimum wage jobs are for. And if we increase the minimum wage, we're going to increase the products that those minimum wages are creating, which is a revolving door. It, it doesn't get us anywhere. We've got to make sure that we're using our technical colleges, that we're using our high schools, so that when kids and students get out of those schools, they're ready for a career. Um, I know that schools now are getting rid of their technical programs, you know, shop and, and auto body. Those are things that we should be teaching our children so that there isn't that skills gap or the brain drain, if you will, for this area. Let, let's make sure we keep our high quality students here where we can all succeed. Okay, and then finally, um, the retirement of Representative Dean Coffert means that you've got a pretty crowded primary. Yes. Do you want to highlight any differences between you and your primary opponents on August 12th? Sure. I, I'm a, a dedicated individual. Um, I, I've been willing to work hard and, and negotiate to make sure that we can get something done. In, in 2006, our company went through a, a hardship that required us to to make some really tough budgetary decisions and, and we had to lay off a, an awful lot of people and slowly build our business back up. Um, at that point I said I'm not going to let that happen again. I actually went back to law school. I commuted down here to Madison every single day, finished my law degree in two and a half years instead of three just to make sure that I could make our business successful dealing with the regulatory issues of the state. I, I know firsthand how difficult it is for businesses, small businesses, to expand and excel in Wisconsin and we've got to do a better job of partnering with our businesses so that they want to move here, so that they want to create jobs, so that our children have the opportunity to have high quality jobs that can support their families here in Wisconsin. And having the small business background that I have, um, having dealt with individuals that want to work hard and want to support their families, I can be that voice down in Madison to, to make sure that, that we let businesses know that, hey, move here. We've got the high quality workforce. There's no question about that. But we don't sell ourselves well enough. We don't partner like we should with the people that are that are there to create jobs for our families. Okay, thank you. Thank Ryan you. Pfeiffer of Nina is a Republican candidate in the 55th Assembly District. The primary is August 12th. Ryan, thanks for talking to Wisconsin Eye. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you.